Well, when I was um, a little boy, in second grade, I think this happened, I was on, out at recess one day playing on the playground, and I heard another boy in my, in my class use a word that I'd never heard before. Um, I didn't know what the word meant, um, and, but it had a, a, a kind of an amazing impact among our little group of friends. The boys started laughing and giggling, the girls turned red and ran away, and I thought, that's a powerful word. And I spent the rest of the day thinking about this, the magical powers of this strange word I didn't understand. And I couldn't wait to try it out for myself. So after school, I, I used to walk home in those days, so I walked home to my, our house, and my mom was waiting for me, as always, but I ran straight up to my room, second floor, opened the window, and shouted this word out to our neighborhood as loudly as I could. I have no idea why that was the way I wanted to do it, but I did. And if you've already guessed, it was a four-letter word, rhyming with the word spit. And I quickly learned from my mother's swift and rather forceful reaction that that was not a word I should use, actually, ever again. I think there was even soap involved. But I learned something that day about the power of words about the importance of controlling one's tongue. We're in the fifth week of a series, a summer-long series, from the New Testament book called James, which is actually an ancient letter, just by way of a little bit of review. James is a pastor in the very first century. This is only 10 or 15 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Scholars think that this James is actually the younger half-brother of Jesus himself. Uh, but was not, he was not a follower of Christ during his earthly life, but after the resurrection became a follower and then became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So he's writing this letter as a pastor, and he's concerned about his people that have been uh, scattered from Jerusalem out to outlying regions due to a time of persecution and suffering and trial. It, evidently, some of these young followers of Jesus had begun to question their faith, maybe doubt the goodness of God because of what was happening to them. They were tempted in various ways and beginning to behave in some ways that James sees as decidedly un like and he wants to confront these things in this letter. He's already confronted uh, the issue of partiality. They were showing deference or favoritism to certain people groups, particularly the wealthy, and he confronts that. He's confronted them about the disconnect he sees between what they say they believe and what they are doing, how they are living. He's concerned that they understand that genuine faith always produces life change, change behavior. And now here in chapter 3, he begins to address another issue. He wants to talk to them about their words, how they speak, about their tongues. So we're in James chapter 3. I'm going to read the first 12 verses here, and then we're going to back up and kind of go through and see what God's Word is teaching us today. So James 3, beginning in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. And I'm going to pause here. Um, James is writing this to an entire uh, diverse community of believers who've been spread out from Jerusalem. They've been scattered. So he's writing to really a lot of people in a lot of small churches, but he seems here to focus in on those who teach or those who lead, those whose words influence the direction of the Christian community. That's just what he seems to be saying. We'll talk about that in a little bit, little bit later. Verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Now notice, James here is teaching in a manner a lot like Jesus. Jesus liked to use everyday illustrations to to point out spiritual truth. And James here is doing the same thing. Three examples of small things that direct or control or influence much larger things. A bit in the mouth of a horse, a rudder on a great ship, and the tongue in the mouth of a person. Uh, The words of leaders and teachers can shape the direction of a whole community, he's saying. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. 
For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. We'll pause here again. Right about this point, we should be asking ourselves, what was going on that James was hearing about that compels him to speak in such straightforward, blunt language? What's going on? He's talking to and about teachers, leaders, those who influence communities, those who have positions of influence, and maybe some of them are using words or speaking in ways that are harmful and dangerous. And he speaks very directly. Verse 9, with it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now we're going to stop there and talk about what James is teaching the people he was writing to and what God might be wanting to tell us today. First thing we see here is the power of the tongue, the power of the words that we say. And I want to begin with a little quiz. It's been a while since I've done this. Maybe you hear the last time I did it. But I'm going to give you um, what I call my famous speech quiz. I'm going to give you a few lines from a famous speech someone once gave. And I want you to guess who gave the speech. And there may be some bonus points about when they gave it, what was the setting, and all that sort of stuff. So I want you to just raise your hand when you think you know the answer. We'll see how quickly some of you catch on. Don't shout it out loud because somebody else may be still struggling. But just raise your hand if you think you know it. Okay? Speech number one. I have a dream. Oh, look at that, okay. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Who gave that speech? Of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. When did he give it? Anybody know the date, the year? 1963. 1963 on August the 28th, and it galvanized the whole nation. In the civil rights movement, we still remember the words he said on that day. Speech number two. Got to go a little bit further back in time. This looks like a sharp audience, though. We shall defend our island. Oh, yeah, some historians out there. Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight in the beaches. We shall fight in the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Okay, who? Winston Churchill, British Prime Minister. When? Ah, close. 1940, June the 4th, 1940, on a radio broadcast, inspired his nation, Great Britain, in the midst of a terrible, bitter war as London was under attack. By the way, uh, some historians have, re- have accounted that immediately after delivering that speech, as he walked out of that room, he commented to a colleague, sort of muttered to a colleague, and will fight them with the butt ends of broken beer bottles because that's bloody well all we've got, he said. Probably good not to include that in the speech. (laughs) Speech number three. Four score and seven years ago. Of course, land of Lincoln, right? Our fathers brought forth in this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Abraham Lincoln, when? What year? 1863. 100 years before Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech. Did you know the Gettysburg Address only includes 272 words? Delivered in two minutes. And we remember it 150 years later. Interestingly, in the midst of that address, Lincoln said, The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And in actuality, the exact opposite happened. We have long forgotten the names of the men who gave their lives on Gettysburg, and we still remember the words Lincoln spoke for two minutes on that day. Last one. My favorite. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. (laughs) You killed my father, prepare to die. Anyone? Actor Mandy Patinkin in one of the greatest cinematography pieces ever created, (laughs) The Princess Bride. The point is, the tongue can influence. The tongue is powerful. It can shape the direction of history through the use of language and words. James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. 
And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. Now, Jesus here, be, I mean, excuse me, James begins by saying, not many of you should become teachers. That's kind of a strange thing for him to say, I think, don't you? I mean, he's talking about the church. He's talking to believers, people who are presumably teaching the gospel, the word of God. Isn't that a good thing? Why does he say you shouldn't do it? Now, we can't know entirely what's going on here, but the role of a teacher in that culture, this would have been Jewish culture, a rabbi, was highly esteemed, uh, was a position of great influence and respect and status. So it's possible that some were aspiring to become teachers just because they wanted the status of being a teacher. And maybe they were unprepared, maybe they were unqualified, maybe some were teaching things that were actually not true. Now, we have to remember, this is only 15 years or so after the resurrection, so they didn't have the entire New Testament printed out like we have today. They had those the apostles who were teaching about Jesus, teaching about the resurrection. They didn't have the book to go by. So maybe some were, were interspersing other things in with the gospel, and they should not be teaching. Now, here at Chapel Street, most of you, I think, are aware that we take teaching God's Word very seriously. We do. Every, every, uh, every two weeks, Pastor Jeff leads a meeting that we call our preaching team meeting. Uh, and we meet for about two hours, all four or five of us who do the preaching. And we pour over and talk about every sermon that's coming up that we're doing. And we want to make sure that, we are, that we're studying correctly, that we're, that we're understanding the truth correctly, and that we're delivering it in, in as p- powerful and as helpful way as we can because, he says, those who teach are going to be held accountable, are going to be judged with greater strictness, he actually says. That's a terrifying thing for those who teach. Years ago, uh, when we had just this campus, I had a friend, uh, and some of you have been here long enough know we used to put, um, we had sermon outlines stuffed into the, the bulletin with like blanks you could fill in and stuff. Now we have a little sheet you can take as well. Uh, but he would take copious notes on every sermon. Point one, point two, point three, my pe- my, all, all that. But he would also, at the end of every sermon, he'd come up. I, I, I knew. He would meet me right down there. He would give me his, what he just took his notes on. But it would be a score sheet. He, he would put on a score of one to ten how I did on each point and then a total score for the whole sermon. It was like the Olympics every week. Now, he was a generous grader in a way. I don't think I ever got below a 9 on something. It would be like 9.4, 9.6, or I missed this point, you know, 9.1 or whatever. But it reminded me, it was kind of funny, but it reminded me that what we do here is important, that teaching matters, what we, how we handle God's Word matters. So and then, he, then the next, next thing he says is teachers must be humble. Teacher must be humble. He says we all stumble in many ways. Some stumble over their words. Some may give a, an illustration that doesn't make sense. We don't always give the best sermon or the best session. We're going to make mistakes. He wants teachers to be humble, to understand that. A pastor named Tim Keller, who has written a book on preaching, who's a pastor in New York City, well-respected, uh, tells young pastors, he's written this in his book, he says, your first 200 sermons, just count on it, are pretty much going to stink. So just relax, go through the process, and learn, okay? That's how he says it. And a couple of years ago, I used that same quote in one of our services, and afterward, one of my friends met me in the lobby and said, congratulations on your 190th sermon, he said. (laughs) Very clever. I thought it was very clever. He says, then those who teach must be able to control their tongues because what we say and how we say it matters. In 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, a young pastor, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. So James is concerned that that does not happen. So he says, like the bit in the mouth of a horse, like the rudder on a great ship, the tongue, our words seem small, but they can exert great power and influence. And that power must be used wisely because not only are words powerful, not only is the tongue powerful, 
it can also be dangerous. That leads us to the second point, that is the danger of the tongue. My wife, Lorena, and I uh, were in Oregon twice in the last four or five weeks, once to watch one of our boys play college baseball, the second time last week for a family funeral, as her, many of you know, her mother uh, passed away a couple of weeks ago, so we were out there for that occasion. And on one of the visits, we were driving, uh, we, they took us to a beautiful place called Mul Multnomah Falls. Anybody been to Multnomah Falls to see it? Just, just a, a place of extraordinary beauty. Uh, as we were on the way there, right as we got to the falls, we noticed whole hillsides that should have been covered with green pine trees and the beautiful trees that are up there. The, the trees were, they were brown and black and some were stumps and they were, and I realized there had been a fire. They'd been burned. And so they told us the story what happened. Last September, after a very dry summer, some high school kids, several buddies, were, were hiking around on one of the the scene, one of Oregon's most scenic hiking trails that looked like this. Can you put that picture up there? Just beautiful area of the country. And they're hiking near Multnomah Falls, and one thing leads to another, and one of the boys who happened to have a sparkler or a, a Roman candle or firework or something on him, and just for kicks, he tossed it into the dry valley below. And that one single firecracker started a wildfire that consumed almost 50,000 acres of pristine forest. Now that boy, 15 years old, eventually he confessed and the judge sentenced him uh, to repay the $36 million it cost to fight that fire. Now that, right now they're debating if that's actually possible or not for a 15-year-old boy to do that, but there was a judgment rendered. So just as a spark in a dry forest is dangerous, James says, so are our words. If you pay attention to social media, some of you may not, and that's probably a good thing, but a TV personality named Roseanne Barr recently discovered the danger of words. A couple of months ago, she issued a single tweet on her Twitter account that included a racially charged insult directed at another person, and that led to the cancellation of her TV show and the utter destruction of her career as an entertainer. Burned up. One word. James says, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now notice James uses two words here to talk about the danger of the tongue, the destructive power of words. The first is fire, uses it four times in just a couple of verses, fire, and the second is deadly poison. And I don't want to read too much into it here, but I think he's thinking of two kinds of particularly dangerous, destructive speech pattern. The first I would call words that are inflammatory. Words and phrases that set on fire, that burn. Uh, a number of years ago, I was on the first team of folks from Chapel Street, then First Baptist, that went to Turkey. We have um, a commitment to the people of Turkey, and uh, we have a lot, number of ministry partners in that part of the world. Some of our own church family members are there serving, and we were one of the first teams to go there. And when we were in one region of Turkey, our guide warned us not to say a word. There was one word we should not say out loud, he said. And that word was Armenian. He said, do not say that word out loud because there is a cultural, religious animosity between the people who live in this region and what happened 100 years ago when 1.5 million Armenians were wiped out by the Ottoman Empire. And there's still, 100 years later, a debate that's so fierce about the cause of that that a Westerner should not even say the word out loud because it will start a fire. So we couldn't say that word. Where many countries around the world right now have laws prohibiting what's called hate speech, that are words that demean or incite violence. In our own country, those hate speech laws don't quite exist yet because there's an ongoing debate between the relationship of free speech and Words that are regarded as so dangerous that they should become criminal if you say them out loud. Now, one of my questions is, do we really need laws to tell us what we should not say out loud? Evidently, in our culture, we do. 
At the more personal level, we all know just through relationships, through marriage, through family, through friendships, we know there are words that we can say, and if we say them, we immediately start a fire. We all know hot-button words like, you're just like your mother. (laughs) You laugh. (laughs) You're just like your father. Or, you never listen. Or, you always. Or, what's wrong with you? Rumors start fires. Gossip starts fires. Someone defined gossip as the art of confessing someone else's sins. <laughs> Lies start fires. Fake news, we hear a lot about that these days, starts fires. Evidently, and now we don't have details, but evidently there were some teachers, leaders, others who were using inflammatory language in a way that James finds problematic, wrong, and he wants it to stop. The second type of word he calls poisonous words, words that don't just inflame, but they kill. Did you see the story a couple of weeks ago about the man in Texas who got bit by a decapitated rattlesnake? You see that story? Fascinating. I mean, I, I have a thing with snakes. I just have, a, I, I have trouble even looking at that image up there. So if you want to just look at me, that's fine. Okay. This guy's name was uh, Jeremy Sutcliffe, 40-year-old man, father. You can look up the story, true story. He's doing yard work, and he sees a rattlesnake in his yard. So he does what any self-respecting Texan will do. He gets a shovel, and he kills the snake. Chop, chops its head right off. So far, so good, right? Goes, does something else for a few minutes, comes back out, he's going to clean up the snake, reaches down, and the decapitated head of that snake bit him and shot him full of venom, He lost his eyesight, began to bleed internally, went into seizures, had to be airlifted to a hospital, and they barely saved his life. Who knew, right, that a decapitated snake could still bite? The venom is deadly. James' image of poisonous words here is a thinly veiled reference to Satan himself, who appears in the very first story of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden account, as a serpent. And the serpent is the liar and the deceiver who tempts, who bends the words of God and tempts Adam and Eve, and the result is what? Spiritual death. James is saying that words can be venomous and can kill. Just yesterday I saw a story, a news story about a mother in Florida of a five-year-old little boy who was going to kindergarten. She noticed throughout the year he, he increasingly seemed not to want to go to school. When he started the year, he wanted to go to school. Then he didn't want to go to school. Then he seemed sad and upset and fearful about going to school. So she wondered what was going on. So she put a a tape recording device in his backpack and recorded like two days worth of what the teacher was saying. And they discovered this teacher, kindergarten teacher, was calling children names. Like, you're such a loser. Uh, You're a bad boy. And the poor child is getting beaten up by words every day at school. And it's now, uh, go, it's, it's now a major deal. And there's a lawsuit going on about this, about this teaching. Or the parent in a moment of anger. And as parents, we all know what that is. We're frustrated. In a moment of anger, calls a child stupid or ugly or good for nothing. And once spoken, those words cannot be taken back. We all heard in kindergarten or second grade, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. And we all know it's not true. Broken bones heal. Words spoken with venom leave marks that don't heal. Words can break hearts. Some words are so poisonous, so venomous, that they threaten to kill the spirit. James says, with it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not be so. Now again, what's going on that Pastor James has to speak so directly and so bluntly? Now he's talking to Jewish background Christians, followers of Jesus. It's a time of of suffering and persecution and fear. And then he says, cursing people made in the likeness of God. Now he's not talking here about profanity. He's assuming that Christians don't talk that way. What he's talking about is speaking in a manner that demeans or disregards or treats people as if they're beyond the love of God. That's what he's talking about. So maybe 
It has to do with the way they were talking about their enemies, those who were persecuting them in the first place. You know, them. We don't know. Maybe they're talking about the Jew, Jewish people who were not believers, who had cast them out, who wanted to persecute them. We don't know. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Maybe James is referring to the way they talked about whole people groups. Now they've been sent out from Jerusalem. They're rubbing shoulders with other parts of the world, like with Romans and with the Greeks and with Gentiles, people of different cultures, different languages, different habits, different religions. Maybe they're saying things about them, assuming they're outside the love of God. Many of you have heard of a church in Kansas called Westboro Baptist Church. Sadly, it's a church known mostly for their hatred of anyone who disagrees with their particular brand of Christianity. Their church members are encouraged to show up at different events, sometimes funerals, sometimes parades, and to hold signs that express their hatred, like this one. You put the first sign up there? No, but go back one. Is there one that says God hates you? There you go. And they're encouraged to hold signs up like this, to the parade, even to funerals. This one was shown at a, was held up after a mass shooting. Go to the next one. You remember there was a mass shooting in a nightclub that was frequented by people who self-identified as gay? This is the way that church responded. Westboro Baptist Church actually sued for the right to hold these kinds of signs. James says, my brothers, these things ought not be so. Not among you who have believed and received the grace of Christ. Those of you who worship God with your mouths on Sundays must not curse others on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. Now notice in verse 8 he says, but no human being can tame the tongue. In other words... Only God, only by divine intervention can the tongue be tamed. And that brings us to the third point, which I'm calling the source of the tongue. He takes us to the source of the tongue. Let me read again so you hear it. Beginning in verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Sounds like James went to some ancient circuses. People have been training animals for a long time. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Okay, so we know the tongue is powerful. It can shape and direct even history itself. We know that words can be dangerous. They can start fires. They can kill. And then James says, no one can tame it. So what are we left to do? James takes us right to the source. Verse 11. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both salt, fresh water and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now James uses illustrations. I said like Jesus used illustrations from everyday life, things that people understood. Here he uses water, fig trees, grapevines, and all make the same point. So I want you to think about it this way. Let's say I was out doing yard work, which it was yesterday, and um, I get hot and thirsty, so I go in and decide to get a drink out of my kitchen faucet, and I turn on the spigot, and this is what comes out. You're going, no, don't drink that, right? If it came out brackish and brown, what would I do? Would I think, oh, I, I just need to change the faucet. I need to change the fixture. I need to change the knobs. The knobs are probably wrong on this. No. I wouldn't do that. I would try. I would assume that's coming from somewhere. Where's the source of that? Is it, our, is it our, our water softener? Is there rust in there? Do we have rusty pipes? Maybe it's the city. Maybe the whole city's being polluted with bad water. I would look for the source of the bad water. That's what James is saying. In Luke 6, Jesus said, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes. This is what's in James' mind. Or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And then this. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. This is Jesus. Let me say that again. Listen to this. For the mouth speaks 
what the heart is full of. Last week, James talked about the relationship between faith, what we believe, and how we live, what we do. He says what we do bears witness to what we believe. Today he's talking about the relationship of speech, our tongue, to our hearts. What we say, the words we speak, is a dead giveaway for the content of our hearts. So what does he want us to do about it? Most of us can remember as younger children uh, having our doctor's appointment, annual checkup, physical. Maybe you go to the school nurse. And the very first thing the doctor would do would be Say, stick out your tongue and go, ah. And they'd take that little tongue depressor. They'd stick it in there. You can all do that right now. No, you don't have to do that. But why would a doctor look at your tongue first? Well, because a trained physician, by examining your tongue, can get evidence of what's happening in the rest of your system, the rest of your body. So what's James say? He's saying, stick out your tongue. Stick out your tongue. Let's take a good look at what's going on with your tongue. Because if your words are venomous or are inflammatory, if how do you speak when you get angry? How do you speak to those in your family? Do you happen to speak about those who aren't in the room? When I talk about someone who's not in the room, when I say negative things about a neighbor who I don't really know, I don't just have a gossip problem. James says, I have a heart problem. When I speak in ways that hurt, or that inflame. I don't just have a language problem. I have a heart problem. That's what James is saying. Go to the source. Your words come from somewhere. They come from your heart. So he says, those of you who know Jesus, those of you who have received his grace, go to the heart. Surrender again your heart, which is where he wants to dwell through his spirit, and so that that which comes out of your mouth, that which comes out of our mouths, will bear witness to the one who dwells in our hearts. His point is eminently simple, but very, very profound. Our speech, our words, bear witness to what we carry in our hearts. Therefore, they bear witness to Christ himself. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you for your word today, for this practical and blunt wisdom from a pastor named James. And by your Spirit, the one who makes the Word come alive, who causes the Word to speak to us, remind us, and if necessary, convict us that our words matter, our speech matters. And we ask you to purify the source of all we say and do. Purify our hearts before you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.